Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, Bodhinyana Great Southern here in Albany, Western Australia. Um, this is the. Uh, my name is Venerable Mudu. Uh, today is Thursday, the second of July, two thousand and twenty, and it's um, twenty minutes to nine in the morning on this uh, beautiful day here in Ellica, which is a, a kind of a rural suburb of Albany, which is about four and a half hours drive south of Perth from Ajahn Brahm's monastery in Serpentine. So, um, yeah, this, uh, this is getting, we're getting close now to the uh, entry to the rains or the rains period for the monks, the three months rains retreat. We're having our celebrations on, on Sunday, Sunday coming, having a, a, um, a group of our supporters here in Albany and the Greats around the Great Southern. So actually we, we look after the whole of the Great Southern. So that's uh, Denmark, uh, Mount Barker and a lot of the surrounding towns there as well. 13 hours, gonna keep an eye on the time. So, 42, okay. So, yeah, today uh, might be the last talk uh, for a little while. Um, I believe that the monks will probably stop delivering these Corona Dharma daily talks. And um, so if you want to uh, come, uh, if you want to hear me speak, you'll have to come all the way to Albany. and. Uh, then you'll be able to see me do uh, Friday night talks. So we're going to, we've decided to continue the Friday night talks um, here in Albany. Um, yeah, just to kind of keep the, the community um, well fed in the Dharma. So what else was I gonna say? So yes, so thank you very much for those of you all around the world and all around Australia that have been uh, listening to these um, the talks that uh, I've done a small handful of them already. So thank you for your support uh, watching. Uh, today I wanted to talk about um, uh, some uh, a topic that uh, we talked about on Friday night, uh, the last talk we had here in Albany. Um, uh, this is a topic uh, about um, it kind of fits in with uh, the Buddha's Eightfold Path and the, the part of that called right speech. So right speech, you know, talking about, uh, talking about the right things and saying things that are kind. Um, I mean, for those of you who are Westerners, I don't know if this applies as much if you're Asian, but... Um, My mum would always say, don't say anything at all unless it's going to be something nice. Or if you haven't got something nice to say, then don't say anything at all. And that's, quite, that's quite a Buddhist saying, really, because it, uh, it fits in very, very well with uh, right speech. <clears throat> it really isn't uh, worthwhile saying anything unless you have something nice to say. And, uh, um, you know, I remember my mum saying that. And then uh, to us uh, three boys, me and my two brothers, um, I don't know if we uh, took uh, much notice back then. Um, certainly probably just thought it was just mum telling us off when we kind of um, said something nasty to one, uh, to one of the other brothers. But... Um, yeah, there is something in that because uh, when you do say something um, not nice, something mean to somebody, um, it does cause them it, it does cause them hurt. And even sometimes in, in jokes as well, when you're joking around, you really got to be careful uh, what you say because you can uh, hurt people's feelings. And um, it also hurts yourself as well. Because when you, when you kind of say something that's unkind and it comes from a, uh, a mind that is um, 
um, you know, trying to hurt the other person with, with harsh words. And it leaves a residue, it leaves a stain in your mind. And uh, this is where it doesn't help your meditation. Because all of these uh, negative things in your life, they add up. And they tend to hang around when you come to sit down and meditate. It may not be those specific instances of um, um, unkind words, thoughts or actions towards others that, that come up in your meditation. But like I said, it leaves a residue, a stain on your mind, a dark, a darkness, a dark cloud. And uh, that doesn't, uh, doesn't help uh, meditation very much. So to illustrate this, um, there's uh, quite a well-known story. Some of you might have heard of this. <coughs> I, I heard it from Ajahn Brahm, and I think Ajahn Brahm said he heard it from Ajahn Chah. And it is called um, the Chicken Plucking Ceremony. So the story goes, uh, come about through um, uh, a young man in the village just got married and his, um, to his beloved wife, who he cherished very much, very dearly, thought the world of her. But for some reason, uh, they must have had a small argument and some unkind words came out of his mouth, directed towards his uh, newly wedded wife. And... Um, she got very upset and she cried and then the man realised he had said some nasty things and wished that he could somehow undo them. So he, um, he knew of this wise monk, Ajahn Chah, and thought, if I go and see Ajahn Chah, he'll be able to help me. He'll have some sort of solution to this so I can um, undo the wrongs and make everything right. And as if this, uh, these unkind uh, words I said to my wife will go away. So he went to see Ajahn Chah. And um, he's a Thai monk. He's actually the Thai monk that uh, was Ajahn Brahm's teacher. And also responsible for bringing, uh, teaching all the other Western monks that you'll see all around the, all around the world wearing robes of this colour. The Thai forest tradition. So we, we, we hold Ajahn Chah in very high reverence in our tradition. So he went to see, this fellow went to see Ajahn Chah, Ajahn Chah, and he explained the story to Ajahn Chah, told him how upset he was that he'd said unkind words to his wife and uh, was worried, was concerned that, uh, you know, maybe she might uh, leave him because uh, seeing this kind of nature in him that he didn't want her to see. Ajahn Chah, wise monk, said, don't worry. I can uh, make all of this, uh, I can sort this out for you. Want, you really want to undo this, uh, um, this, uh, these unkind words you, you said to your wife. And then I have, uh, I have a, a special ceremony that we can do that will undo everything you've said and it will be as if nothing had ever happened. And this bloke got really excited. He said, yes, 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 I'd love to, love to do that. What do I need to do? And Ajahn Chah said, well, you need to follow my instructions very, very clearly, very specifically. Follow all the things that I say. And don't miss a single thing. You have to follow it exactly to the word, to the letter. And the guy said, for sure, for sure, no worries. So Ajahn Chah said, the first thing you need to do on your way home after um, you leave here, you need to stop at the markets. And at the markets, you need to buy a chicken and one of these dead chickens, you know, that you have, uh, have for dinner. And on the way home, you need to pluck all of the feathers out of the chicken. Don't miss a single feather. Pluck all of the, chick all of the chicken's feathers on the way home, and then pop the uh, chicken in the fridge, and then come and see me the next day with the chicken. And so uh, um, Ajahn Chah said, make sure you follow those rules exactly as I say, otherwise this ceremony won't work and you won't be able to undo those words, unkind words that you said to your wife. So that's what he did. He went home. Uh, on his way home, he stopped at the markets, bought a chicken, plucked every single feather from that chicken, put it in the fridge. Uh, the next day, uh, 
grabbed the chicken from the fridge, uh, went to see Ajahn Chah and told him what he had done. Ajahn Chah said, very good. You followed all of my instructions to the T. So that's part one of the chicken plucking ceremony. Now this I'm going to tell you now is part two and you need to follow this even more importantly. You need to follow this exactly as I say, otherwise this ceremony won't work and you won't be able to undo uh, those uh, unkind words you said to your wife. So Ajahn Chah said, this is part two, this is what you need to do. Go back home um, after uh, you leave here, leave the temple, go on your way home, go uh, following exactly the same path that you left yesterday and pick up every single one of those feathers. And once you've picked up every single one of those feathers from that chicken, insert each feather back in exactly the same hole where it came from. And that's when this guy looked at Ajahn Chah and said, are you crazy? That's impossible. I could never do that. And that's when Ajahn Chah said to him, exactly. He said, um, just as uh, the same as you've said those unkind words that left your mouth when you spoke them to your wife, once they left your mouth, there is no way you can um, put those words back in your mouth. Exactly the same as the chicken. Once you pluck those feathers out, and there's so many of them and they all blow away, there's no way you're going to get them back into that uh, chicken. So really, there is no way to undo unkind words. The only uh, thing you can do is not say them in the first place. So that was the, that was the lesson the sto through that story, through Ajahn Chah, about um, saying unkind words and uh, um, right speech, not actually saying them in the first place, which linked back to what my mum told me as a child. If you don't have anything nice to say, then don't say it at all. <coughs> So these are some of the, uh, uh, the, the things that you might not think has anything to do with meditation, but it has a lot to do with meditation because these sorts of uh, uh, unwholesome actions leave a stain on the mind, on your own mind, and uh, it, it becomes a hindrance for you uh, for living a, a happy uh, life and um, you have this cloud over your head and then when you come to sit meditation, it, that those sorts of... Uh, black clouds over your head aren't particularly helpful. So what do you do? You forgive yourself for these things that you've done in the past and unkind words you've said to others. And you, um, you may not have, if you can, you can go and see those people and ask for forgiveness, apologize to them. But if you can't, you just do that in your mind and you forgive yourself as well. And just start afresh. So there's some tips for uh, meditation. Um, and how uh, right speech can actually you know, help your meditation. So speaking of meditation, we'll do some meditation now. Just a very short meditation. <coughs> um, 43, 53, so it's going to be about just a little over 15 minutes of meditation. And um, that'll be half an hour, which is all this camera records. So um, we will start... Uh, with the meditation now, so get yourself nice and comfortable. <clears throat> so I'm just going to readjust uh, my body. Today we're very blessed here. We've got a lovely, um, lovely rainy, foggy day down on the valley there. And I'll, I have got, I took some images beforehand, which I'll um, try and edit into this, uh, this um, video. We see down there the lovely um, uh, place we have to meditate here at Bodhanyana Great Southern. So once you're comfortable, first thing you do is close your eyes. With your eyes closed, that's one of the sense doors uh, shut down. But take a moment to see what you see with your eyes closed. What, what uh, stimuli is your mind... Uh, are using to create imagery in your in your mind. Have a quick look. And 
for me with her eyes closed. It's just like a, it's like a, uh, it's like it uh, symbolizes a starting point of my meditation. And uh, just by closing my eyes, this huge weight gets lifted off my shoulders of all the duties and uh, busyness I have here at this new monastery. Close my eyes. I'm no longer the boss monk, head monk, abbot, whatever you want to call it. It's just, uh, it's just, um, well, there's nobody here really. So I just um, let all those identities and uh, ideas of self and sense of I, just kind of let them go for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes. So that first part of meditation for me, closing the eyes, brings up a lot of, a lot of joy. And then the other senses, you can kind of uh, have a quick look at those as well. Uh, sense of uh, taste, sense of smell, just noticing what's there. Not much going on there, so yeah, they're kind of, uh, there's no sensory stimuli there, but still kind of acknowledge them. Then move on to the next, the five senses. A sense of sound. And here there's, uh, there's, um, there's not a lot of sounds at the moment. We've got the fridge uh, next door because we've got our, uh, a meditation hall and, and the kitchen. It's all in the one kind of place. So we're only just uh, new starting off here. But also in the background there's the hum or the deep drone of the waves uh, crashing on the 120 meter high cliffs that are only 500 meters to my left. So between us, between, the, between here and the ocean, there's only 500 meters of state forest. You can kind of hear that uh, droning sound of the ocean, the waves crashing against the cliffs. So I take a moment to notice those uh, pleasant sounds. And then moving on to the body, the last of the five senses. Let's do a quick uh, body sweep meditation. First, just making sure my body's comfortable. It's not too bad. Just moving from my feet. Just noticing the sensations, any tension or tightness, so just quickly move through there because we don't have a lot of time. So just a quick body scan. Most of my discomfort is always in my kind of knees and feet and ankles. So they're as comfortable as they can be. Move my way up through the rest of the body, the legs, through the tummy. Tummy's happy. I ask my tummy, are you happy? says yes, no complaints there, then move to my breath. Source of uh, a lot of joy from my meditation. Buddha himself using breath meditation and uh, speaking quite a lot about it. So why not, uh, no point uh, reinventing the wheel looking for other meditation techniques. I always go with the breath. I don't latch onto the breath. I let the breath come to me. This is obviously something Ajahn Brahm has taught me. You don't go searching stuff out. You just wait for it to come to you. You just be kind and calm and peaceful. Allow things to be. And uh, the breath uh, eventually will come to you. So I move uh, from my breath the rest of my body, up to the shoulders, down my arms, up, up into my, and lastly up into my neck. Finally up into the top of my head. noticing any sensations in my eyes and in my, around my mouth. And 
with the body as comfortable as it can be. We can pop the body down. And let go of the body. And very gently, very kindly, move our attention, our awareness inside into the mind. do you see in your mind? What does it look like? And how does it feel? job as a meditator is to just hang out with the mind, be a friend to the mind, allow the mind to just uh, be, allow it to do what it feels it needs to do without you getting in the way. Your job is to be like a silent observer, not getting involved. Allowing things to be. However your mind wants to be. If your mind is busy, then just watch it be busy. When you bring that sort of kindness to your mind, After a while, the mind will just become naturally uh, relaxed and peaceful by itself. It does that because you're not trying to force it, you're not trying to control it into being calm. The mind just sees you uh, being like a friend. It doesn't want to resist and do the opposite to what you're hoping it would want to do, which is to be calm. So bring this kindness to your mind. And just allow your mind to be. So for those of you who may have not meditated before, this is meditation. It's essentially hanging out with your mind, 
allowing it to be, not forcing it, just observing, just sub watching. Meditation is not the end result, whether you got peaceful or you didn't get peaceful or you got into this state of meditation or that state of meditation. No, it's simply hanging out with your mind, allowing it to be, allowing the peace to just find you all by itself. comes to visit me. It can come in several ways. One of the ways it first appears to me is in, is, uh, is in this imagery that comes to the mind. Sometimes uh, we call these images or lights in the mind nimitas. They can be varying uh, different intensities, but usually for me, uh, they start off as these very peaceful, uh, swirling, intense, a different intensity, going from light to dark, different shades of light. Pleasant to be in the presence of. And it just it brings this uh, sense of peace with it which in itself is quite delicious. Another way uh, peace comes to visit me uh, through a method that most people have heard of um, called breath meditation. But it's less of me doing the breath meditation. It's more about the breath coming to visit me. So I notice after a while when my mind becomes peaceful, uh, this breath comes to visit me. Also, this breath is delicious. It's very smooth, it's very light, it's very silky, it's very effortless. extremely pleasant to be around and it's always accompanied by peace. Ajahn Brahm calls this uh, visiting from the breath in this way the beautiful breath or the delightful breath. When the breath comes to visit you in this way. Your task is just to be with it like a friend, but to value it. Don't walk past it looking for something else. This is such a wonderful, great gift. The beautiful breath comes to visit you. Just hang out with it. Just enjoy uh, the bliss that comes with it. And when you do this, you have this level of contentment and joy that comes up. Then um, this can be, come all by itself, a tipping point for other uh, deeper um, stages of meditation. These aren't stages of meditation you go looking for. You just hang out with the breath and let those other meditation stages come to you. So now we're getting close to the end of the meditation. I'm going 
to ring the gong three times. After the sound of the third gong, please come out of meditation. So thank you everybody once more from around Australia and around the globe for sharing these uh, meditation sessions with me and uh, may you have uh, a wonderful day and if you're um, devoting a little bit more time to your practice during these coming three months of the Rains Retreat then I wish you all the best. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.